Hello, welcome to our weekly service from Stanley Road Baptist Church. If you don't know, my name's Stephen. I'm one of the pastors at Stanley Road and it's wonderful to welcome you. If you're a regular with us, part of our uh, worshipping congregation at Stanley Road, good to have you with us. If you're visiting us from somewhere else, maybe this is the first time you've called in, again, a warm welcome. Thank you for joining us. Uh, this is, we're now into our second year of producing these services, having had the anniversary uh, last year, the uh, last week, the uh, 52nd service. So, um, yeah, we're getting used to worshipping like this, aren't we? But it's good to have you with us and we do seek for today to be a act of worship that you don't just come and watch a video, but actually you're actively uh, involved with and engaged with God through what we put together today. Uh, later on in the service, we'll be hearing from our colleague uh, Mark Young, who will be uh, teaching us from our recent series on the life, the humanity of Jesus. We'll also be sharing uh, communion together. So it is a year on. It is uh, uh, on Tuesday, it will be in a year since our Prime Minister announced the first uh, lockdown. So it does seem like this is a time when a lot of us are, are looking back on what's happened over the past year or in, in a case more to the case, what's not happened. And uh, we as a church are also looking forward. We're looking forward to uh, next week, the 28th, when we'll be back in our church building holding services again. There'll be more details about that later. But I wonder if you look back through the year, whether you will be able to echo the words of the psalmist in Psalm 91. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the, might, the Almighty. He says, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. What do you say on this day as you're watching this service? What do you say of the Lord? What do you say of the Lord as you gather to worship him through this service? I wonder what words would you use to describe him and your relationship with him today? The psalmist says, uses words like refuge, fortress, somewhere he can place his trust. And we do pray that that will be your experience of God today and indeed every day, for that you find him to be your refuge, your fortress, somewhere where you can place your trust. And that's our prayer as we look again at Jesus, both through our Bible passage and then through our communion as we share. We look again at Jesus, that in him we can have confidence, hope, and trust. Let me pray for us now as we worship together. Lord, as we continue uh, week by week to worship in this way, Lord, we do so confident that you are our refuge, our fortress, that we can trust in you. Lord, we also trust that you work, Lord. Your spirit is at work when your people gather, commit to worshipping together through the same means. And your spirit is at work, Lord, when your word is opened, as it will be later by Mark as he preaches. And Lord, your spirit is at work when we remember. We remember the sacrifice that Christ gave for us at the cross. So, Lord, we are confident and we trust that through our worship today, that your spirit will be at work in that perfect way, encouraging, challenging and changing each one of us as you would have us be. Lord, may this time be a time of blessing and may everything we say and do give you all the glory, all the honour and all the praise. Amen. So now it's time for our first song and this is one we've not had during our video services but it's one that we were really getting to know when we were back a year ago in our services. It's, it's actually now just over a year since the new Scottish Hymns Band came to play that concert that they did at Stanley Road. You remember that when they raised money for Tear Fund and uh, we were really tapping along and, and praising God with them at that, at that concert. And this is one of the ones that we've really got to know in the run-up to that concert and that they played for us at the concert, which reminds us it's, it's from one of the Psalms that reminds us of the, the authority of God, that wherever we may go, he is there with us. He's our refuge and our strength. Let's sing, Were I to Cross from Land to Land. For 
scheme with ill intent Their days are numbered too How precious are your thoughts to me How countless, Lord, they are More than the shores have grains of sand More than the skies have stars As I mentioned before, uh, on the 28th of March, so that's uh, the next Sunday from after this Sunday's service has gone live, so not long to go, uh, we are returning to services in our church building. There's been quite a bit of work going on the last two or three weeks, getting ready for this, making the decision and then getting the place ready that we're able to accommodate uh, all those who wish to come into the services. So uh, from the 28th of March, there'll be two services from Stanley Road Baptist Church on a Sunday morning. There'll be one at 9 a.m. and one at half past 10. So when we did a survey of, of a number of you, some of you said that actually I, I will be prepared to come at 9 a.m. So we're looking to, for, to some of you to, to come at 9 a.m. to take a bit of pressure off the 10.30 when the majority of people we expect uh, to come. So yeah, if you're able to come at 9, do come. And then there'll be an almost identical service at half past 10. The services will be about 50, 55 minutes long, something like that. Please don't come more than 15 minutes before the service. So at the earliest, 8.45 for the 9 o'clock or 10.15 for the 10.30 because we're not allowed to have people mingling around the building in significant numbers. And when you come, uh, particularly if you come to the 10.30, stewards will direct you to a certain seat. You may not be able to sit in the seat where you've sat uh, all your life because of the, the way we have to keep people socially distanced. So there are some precautions we have to take that's one of the precautions sadly we're not able to sing as congregations and we do have to wear masks and and sadly afterwards we're not allowed to, to stay around for a cup of tea or even a chat particularly not in the building all mingling if any conversation should really take place off the church premises it's not really nice talking like this but there is blessing in coming together when we have met over the past 12 months we have been able to meet in in the church there has been a sense of yeah it's good to at least see you behind the mask and good to be together so we do pray that as more of you do begin to return to our church building for services of worship that you too feel blessed despite all the restrictions we're having to put up with at the moment so we think there should be room for everybody who wants to come, who has indicated they want to come. Uh, so we don't think you're going to have to book, but we're going to try this for, uh, for six weeks and see how we get on. So uh, nine o'clock and then at 10.30 a.m. the service will include uh, some activities for children to do in their seats. We're not able to do children's groups at this time. We're not allowed to do that. Um, but there will be some activities for children to do if, they, if you wish to come as part of a family. So as I say, that starts on March 28th. Now that's the day that the clocks change. So if you're going to come for nine o'clock, you really got to be on it. You really got to be up and about and sorted out for that. Then on Good Friday, there will just be a 10.30 service in the church. And then on Easter Sunday, again, 9 a.m. and 10.30 a.m. If you've got any questions at all about this or, or comments, or whatever you might do, get in touch uh, with myself. I'm more than happy to answer any questions or, or explain what's going to happen and, and those kind of things. So yeah, so March the 28th, 9 a.m., 10.30, Good Friday, 10.30, Easter Sunday, 9 a.m. and 10.30.
Now also in Holy Week, as you've been hearing the last two or three weeks, we're having a prayer day on Wednesday, March the 31st. All the details uh, are on the screen. And this is a specific day which we're setting aside and really encouraging us as individuals and as church to resolve particularly that day to spend the day focused uh, in prayer. So there's going to be sessions on Zoom at 9 a.m., at 1 p.m. and 7 p.m. It will be best for you and for everybody if you're able to commit to all three of those sessions because they'll follow on from each other and they'll lead you through the day. Uh, you should have received um, a, a, a resource that will help you uh, structure your day around prayer and around the passage we're looking at in Mark chapter 8. If you've not got that, again, do uh, get in touch. And we just encourage you, there's going to be a prayer walk from the church at 10.30 in the morning. So you're able to go along to that. That'll be going around in maximum groups of six, all distanced at least two metres. So do remember your masks and all that kind of thing. So the walk will be about an hour. So if that's going to be a struggle for you, maybe best uh, to pray at home. Or maybe you might want to ring somebody up and pray together over the phone, or maybe just meet somebody on the promenade or in a park and just to catch up and have a time of prayer or whatever it may be. We encourage you to set aside that day I know some of you will be, be working, there will be resources available through WhatsApp or for you to have at the beginning or the middle and the end of the day for, for if you're not able to join in the Zoom session. So I really do encourage you to set aside. May we all be saying, I will say of the Lord, Lord, you are my refuge, you are my fortress. As we pray, we're saying, Lord, it's you in whom we put our trust. So that's on March 31st. So I say all the info about that, so there's lots of info, should have come out over the weekend if you've not got it, do drop me a line. As we, as I said before, it's communion later on, so you might need to pause the video and to get uh, some elements so you can take part later on. But now I'm going to hand over to David Walsh, who's going to read this week's reading before Mark uh, preaches from it. Good morning, I'm David Walsh, bringing you God's Word today from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 12, starting at verse 22. Then they brought him a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute, and Jesus healed him so that he could both talk and see. All the people were astonished and said, Could this be the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard this, they said, It's only by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, that this fellow drives out demons. Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined, and every city or household divided against itself will not stand. If Satan drives out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then can this kingdom stand? And if I drive out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your people drive them out? So then they will be your judges. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or again, how can anyone enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man, then he can plunder the house? Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. And so I tell you, every kind of sin and slander can be forgiven, but blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. Make a tree good and its fruit will be good. Or make a tree bad, and its fruit will be, will be bad. For a tree is recognised by its fruit. You brood of vipers, 
how can you who are evil say anything good? For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. But I tell you that every one will have to give account on the day of judgment for every empty word they've spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. Amen. Hello, my name's Mark. I'm one of the pastors at Stanley Road Baptist, and it's my privilege to open up God's Word for us today. Now, during this period of Lent, we've been examining closely uh, Jesus' life, looking how he walked, and also how he dealt with challenges as we try to walk in his footsteps. Now, one of the difficult things about being a follower of Jesus is that it can make you unpopular. Now, when I was in my early 20s, maybe through to my early 30s, uh, there was a group of intellectuals who came to be known as the New Atheists, and they were very, very influential. They wrote a lot of very popular books, which everyone from my generation was, was reading. They were on television an awful lot. They were commenting on talk shows, and they, you'd hear them on the radio uh, all the time. And uh, they certainly didn't think it was a good thing to follow Jesus Christ. In fact, they didn't just think that Christianity wasn't true. They actually believed that to follow Jesus and to preach the gospel and tell people the good news was evil. And now one of these men was Christopher Hitchens, who, who sadly passed away. But uh, during his lifetime, uh, he said about uh, Billy Graham, who many of you will know the name Billy Graham. He was a great evangelist of the 20th century. Many people came to follow Jesus through him. And uh, while Billy Graham was ill, Christopher Hitchens said about him that he was a disgusting, evil man, and he hoped that he would die soon. Um, and uh, that's just the sort of thing that they felt able to say because they saw following Jesus as evil. Now, uh, many of them are still around, still writing books today, but fortunately, uh, men like Richard Dawkins aren't as nearly as popular anymore, and people aren't being influenced by them. But it did make it very difficult to be a Christian during that time. Uh, nowadays, we can still face that sort of opposition, but I think it's more likely to come uh, through following the ethics and the morality that Jesus and, and God taught through the Bible and, and Jesus' followers taught through Scripture. And quite often, uh, the Christian church and those who belong to the church are called evil uh, because we're upholding some of the, that morality that God has taught for humanity. And so this might even for you have, have become a personal thing where perhaps a friend or a family member has accused you just because you follow Jesus Christ of some sort of evil uh, simply because you're a follower. Well, Jesus faced the same sort of opposition and accusation. In Matthew chapter 12 today, uh, we're going to see Jesus actually uh, being accused of being in league with the devil himself. Now, it's interesting because this portion of scripture that we've read actually begins with uh, Jesus doing something amazing for someone. A demon-possessed man is brought to him who was blind and mute, and Jesus healed him so that he could both talk and see. Somebody is freed from demon possession and the oppression on his life, the limitations on his life are taken away. He's able to talk and see. And so that meant all the people were astonished and they asked the question, could this be the son of David? Who are you going to ask that question of? Well, the sort of people who should know. And at that time, that was the Pharisees. And when the Pharisees heard this, they said, it is only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this fellow drives out demons. And as we go through this passage, it's really important to remember that Jesus had just freed someone from slavery to a demon, had healed them of the physical ailments as a result of that slavery, and had given them new life. And it was an amazing thing that everyone was astonished at. And the Pharisees uh, 
suggestion is that he did it because he's in league with the devil, not opposing him. Well, we're going to see how Jesus responded to this accusation that he uh, is in league with Satan himself. So the first thing I noticed in how Jesus responds to his accusers is that he gets into the debate. He answers them. He makes a counter argument. Uh, it's interesting in the book of Matthew, a lot of uh, the accounts of what Jesus does and says are quite short and concise and we're really only getting the bare bones of what was actually said and done. In this instance, it slows right down and we get the full uh, content of Jesus' answer. So it's obviously important that he slows down and he makes the argument. Now that's challenging to us today because to argue with someone, to debate with someone, to answer them if they disagree with you, is getting riskier and riskier. Now we think it's because of social media, because it's so much easier to be a keyboard warrior and to insult someone and disagree with them online. Uh, it's also easier uh, online to stop listening to people who disagree with you and just surround yourself by influences that are the same, have the same opinion as you and to forget that there are people who might not agree with you. Um, but it is getting harder to debate. And it's much easier just to ignore people who have hold different opinions to you and uh, disagree with you or may even be insulting you and just to stick with the people who agree and not get into the debate. But that's not what Jesus does. <clears throat> and we, it, a lot of it is because there's a personal risk to us. We will get insulted. We will get driven out. We might uh, have some really negative comments on our Twitter feed, on our Facebook page or whatever. But it couldn't have got more personal for Jesus. <clears throat> As with Jesus, uh, he, he didn't really believe he could persuade these Pharisees that they were wrong and for them to turn around and follow him and support him. He knew they were going to keep accusing him until one day they would accuse him right onto the cross and cause his death. And yet he still engaged with them despite the fact that he was going to be insulted, he was going to be beaten, he was going to be put to death for disagreeing with them. So why did he engage? Why did he make the argument? Why did he make himself vulnerable in that way? Well, I believe it's not because he believes he can persuade the Pharisees, but it's because the Pharisees have such influence over other people. The people who have seen Jesus do these miracles, they go to the Pharisees and they say, can this be the son of David? In other words, who, you tell us, you should know better. You're the religious leaders. You're the ones with influence and power and know what's what. Can we follow this man? And uh, so many people who don't know Jesus as their saviour may be asking the question, who is Jesus? What is this church? What is this Christianity thing? Can I follow him? And if they don't know a Christian who's willing to make the argument and willing to engage with them, the chances are the answer they're going to hear is no. Following Jesus is bad. Christianity uh, is evil for reasons A, B, C, and D. Uh, don't go to the church uh, because you'll only uh, have heartache and problems. But Jesus knew that the crowd was listening to the Pharisees and so he engaged in the argument. <clears throat> and it was an easy argument. So first answer is, Every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined. So how can he be driving out demons if he's doing it um, with the power of Beelzebub, the chief of demons himself? Every city or house divided against itself will not stand. And if Satan drives out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then can his kingdom stand? That's argument number one, and it's pretty obvious. The second one is, if I drive out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your people drive them out? So there were disciples of the Pharisees who also drove out demons. Jesus is saying, well, if I drive them out by Beelzebul, what are your guys doing? Surely they're doing the same thing. And then finally, how can anyone enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man? Then he can plunder his house. Now this is a really strong image. This shows us of Jesus by casting out demons, by dealing with evil, that he has the power to bind Satan. Satan is the strong man 
and he can plunder Satan's house and free and rescue people from evil. Now, when we think about making arguments and debates and getting involved in conversations, it brings us great fear, uh, no matter how uh, intellectual or knowledgeable we feel we are, because we know it can have great personal consequences. And I think for a lot of us, it, it is a bit easier to leave it up to those who are more intellectually able and more knowledgeable and have read more books and all the rest of it. But don't forget the powerful testimony that started this whole conversation. A man has been oppressed by evil, oppressed by demons. Jesus comes along, frees him, and he can talk, and, uh, and, and he, can, um, he can see what Jesus has done, and he speaks about it, and that's what starts this whole thing off. So quite often, uh, when you're uh, feeling like you need to speak up for Jesus or for Christ, because one of your friends or family members believes something wrong about Christianity, the place to start and to finish is what Christ has done for you. And your personal testimony is going to be the thing uh, that, that has real power because Jesus has done something for you. So I want to pause and stop and take a moment to think about that. Is there someone in your life, friend, family member, a colleague, who believes things that are wrong, who believes lies about Christ, about the church, about Christianity, that you could personally challenge with them in a loving way, um, engaging with them and telling them about your story with Jesus? The second thing I noticed about how Jesus is responding to his accusers is that he exposes their motivation. He exposes their evil. He says, but if it is by the Spirit of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Now, why have the Pharisees said this great evil thing, that the Spirit of God, who's done this good for this man, is actually the power of Satan. Well, he said it because they're in a corner. Jesus has shown that he's got this power. He has also spoken uh, these great and, and, and wonderful ways about God and about the future. Uh, he is saying that he is the Son of Man, the Son of God, the Son of David, the Messiah, the Saviour who is coming uh, to Israel. And uh, Faced with this absolute proof that the Spirit of God is at work, the disciples, uh, sorry, the Pharisees, two choices. They either admit that Jesus is who he says he is and follow him, or they find some reason to turn their back on him and go the other way. And because the evidence is so great, the reason to turn away has got to be great. And so they tell this monstrous lie. They say that the Spirit of God, who has freed this man from bondage, is actually the Spirit of Satan, is actually Satan himself. And that's why Jesus calls it an unforgivable sin. Uh, because they, they have got this evidence right in front of their eyes, and they actually say, no, it's Satan that's done it. So before you start going accusing people who don't believe, and uh, who say false things about Jesus and about God, do remember the position the Pharisees were in. They should have known much better. But at the same time, this is uh, the basic reason why uh, those who, who do get called to Jesus can end up deciding not to follow him. Because if they follow him, they risk everything. The Pharisees, if they had chosen to follow Jesus, they were risking their power and their authority. They were risking their security. And they might have been risking their lives because they could have been seen as rebels by the Roman authorities and ended up on a cross themselves, as so many of Jesus' disciples did. So 
not wanting to risk our lives and actually putting our lives in the power of God and the power of Jesus and following them and being obedient to someone other than ourselves um, is the reason why so many would reject Jesus. And it is the reason why some lies are told about Jesus and about Christ. Now this doesn't mean that we need to go defending everything that the church has done or everything that Christians have done. Because I want you to notice here that Jesus is very specific that he isn't even defending himself. He's defending the Holy Spirit because he says, anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. So he's not even defending himself. So we need to remember that, that we're defending God and we're defending Christ because not everything the church has done we should defend and not everything Christian people do we should defend, but we should always defend the power of of God. Now, I made the point that there's so much uh, shouting at people that uh, God is not relevant, that Christ wasn't real, that uh, Jesus hasn't got the power to take away sin or to defeat evil. Shouting at people. And uh, Jesus makes the point, whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. So that's another reason for us to speak up and to expose the evil that lies behind some of the lies told about Christianity. Uh, now, as I speak at the moment, uh, the whole nation is enraged because of the murder of Sarah Everard. Um, and that great evil that was done, there's a sense of we need someone to do something about it, whether that's the police or politicians or lawmakers or whatever. Something has to be done to stop women being under threat of violent men. But the fact is that we know that evil dwells in the human heart and is only God who can change the human heart and is only by the power of the Holy Spirit that uh, men and women can be made wholly good. And uh, it is God who seeks uh, to transform human beings to being good. And when that power is denied, and even said that it is evil, uh, then those opportunities fade away. So it's very important for us to be gathering with Jesus, and once again to be speaking and looking for opportunities uh, to speak about the good news of Jesus, what he has done for us and what he can do for communities and for countries and for people everywhere. So stop and reflect for a moment. Are you gathering with Jesus and where could you gather this week? The last thing I notice about how Jesus responds to his accusers is just how confident and bold he is. Now, he is the Son of God. He knows God's word inside and out. He also has insight into the hearts of the Pharisees, and he knows the thoughts of the crowd around him, and he knows what his mission is and where he's going. And uh, we're not Jesus. We are his disciples. We are his followers. And we're flawed, unlike him. And we uh, don't always know the right thing or, or the right uh, to say or to do in so many circumstances and situations. So how do we get that confidence and where does it come from? Well, I think that it all starts in the heart. Now, Jesus is pronouncing judgment on these Pharisees. He says, make a tree good and its fruit will be good or make a tree bad and its fruit will be bad, for a tree is recognized by its fruit. And he's making the point that he's made so many times that when you're not sure about someone, look at the fruit of their life as to whether they should be followed and uh, believed in. And it's important that the fruit of our life is right as well. 
So how do we get that right too? Um, verse 35, Jesus says, A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. And that's the key there. If we want to be able to speak boldly and make counter-arguments against those who believe that Christ is no good and that, uh, that Christianity should not be followed and that Jesus' death on the cross is meaningless, if we want to be able to speak up about that, we have to fill our hearts with good, with the good of God, with the Holy Spirit of God. And that means going back to the old ways of reading God's Word of praying to him and building up that relationship and allowing the Holy Spirit to fill us and to start to change us and tr transform us so that we can speak boldly and confidently about our experiences of God and how he is transforming and changing the world even now. When Jesus was speaking to the Pharisees and hearing them saying, that he was in league with Satan. I don't think he was looking at the Pharisees. He was looking at the crowd who were believing what the Pharisees said. And when we hear people say evil things about God or uh, simply uh, to deny his existence or whatever, we need to be looking at the crowd and looking at the people who are believing what he's saying. Because many of those people are our friends and our family who we love. And we must be confident in making the counter argument. We must be involved with Jesus in gathering and telling the good news and inviting people to follow him. And the only way we'll be able to do it boldly and confidently like Christ is if we're filled with the Spirit of God and filled with all the good things that God has to offer. Amen. So we gather for our time of communion. And as we gather, we do so at the beginning of a week where our nation will hold a day of mourning. On Tuesday, it is exactly a year since the first lockdown was announced. And this has been designated a National Day of Reflection. So later on during our communion we'll use some prayers that have been prepared for this occasion. And through our act of worship the well-known image of a candle will be used. A symbol of Jesus, light of the world. A symbol of us. Jesus describes us as the light of the world. I don't know how you felt about this week's passage, the misguided Pharisees, Jesus' concerns for the crowd who were so easily led by these Pharisees who were getting it so wrong. And hearing from Mark of the challenge, the opportunity and even the responsibility to share the light of Christ with people, despite the consequences that we might face, the risks that we worry about the struggle to know what to say or what to do. You know, feeling the emotions we're feeling today from that passage or whatever else may be going on in our lives. We come to God in prayer now. Let us pray. Compassionate God, we come to you in our need confessing to you what we often dare not admit to ourselves. It is hard to celebrate life when faced with the mystery of death. It is hard to look to the future when surrounded by the uncertainty of the present. It is hard to embrace the day when hope is eclipsed by despair. Help us this day to know you and to find you in the whole of life, its beginnings and its endings to discover you in our pain as well as our joy, in our doubts as well as our believing, to receive this day and in the days to come, comfort from your word and light for our darkness. Amen. 
in our simple meal today, may I remind you that in our tradition, our church tradition, all are invited to this table. It is the Lord's table. He invites all those who love him and seek him to love him more, to share in it. Hopefully you've had the opportunity to prepare elements, perhaps some bread or crackers to symbolise the body of Christ and perhaps some juice or some wine to symbolise the blood of Jesus. If you haven't already done so and you want to take part, perhaps this is a good time to pause the video and to prepare. In the song we heard before, we heard it was based on Psalm 139. Let me read the first few verses of that psalm. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Lord, you have this knowledge, yet still you welcome me at your table. Lord, I thank you. Lord, I thank you that this welcome, this invitation comes at a cost. Not at a cost to me, but to you in the giving of your son, Jesus. As we've heard today, accused of being in league with the devil, yet was ultimately proved victor over the devil. The victor over sin, the victor over judgment by giving his life at the cross. Lord, we thank you. Lord, we thank you. We remember the familiar words from the Apostle Paul, words that we often hear in our communion services at church. I receive from the Lord what I passed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread and when he'd given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. As we've prepared the elements, we've broken the bread or whatever symbol we've used for the body, a symbol of Jesus giving his body at the cross. Just in your own time, take the element, take the body, take the bread, symbol of the body of Christ, and be reminded of his love for you. If you're with other people, sharing communion, serve one another. If you're on your own, make a conscious effort to remember sharing communion in our building. Remember the faces, the sounds, the actions. Allow your senses to be aware of God ministering his grace to you in a variety of ways. We've taken the bread. Do the same. Juice the wine, the symbol of Jesus' blood shed for us at the cross. Again, drink, share together, drink together and let us be thankful. Just have a period of silence while you share the elements with those who you're with or you take time to remember other people who you've, you've shared communion with in the past. And after a period of silence, I'll lead our prayers of intercession. Let us pray. As we look ahead to this coming week, a mark a year on since the first lockdown. As we take this time to reflect, Lord, so we pray. Loving God, you hold all our times in your hands, our past, our present, our future. 
be close to us now as we remember all the difficulties and disappointments of the past year. Be especially close to all of us who are thinking of someone we loved and knew, but see no longer. Perhaps a family member, a friend, a colleague or neighbour. Loving God, you place us in families and communities and we give you thanks for all those around us who help us in so many ways. Give wisdom to community leaders, to our schools, hospitals, care homes and other agencies who make a difference in our lives. Help each of us to have the courage to reach out with thanks and kindness to those around us and to speak words of faith as we share the good news of your love. Loving God, as we journey towards Easter, help us to live as people of hope, knowing that beyond the pain of the cross lies the joy of the resurrection. Inspire us in our worship, through our churches and in our homes, that we may bring glory to you and joy to others. Be with those who are struggling in mind, body or spirit, and give courage to those who are facing uncertainty and change ahead. Help each of us to keep our eyes fixed on you, that we may reflect your light to all whom we meet. Remember verses from Psalm 91. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress my God in whom I trust. As we think, God of love, about all that has changed this year, help us to trust that you are always with us. As we remember those who have died, help us to trust they are at peace with you. And as we reach out to others with kindness and care, may hope shine out in every heart and home. Amen. Amen. Just that line there as we think about all that has changed this year. As I've just led this short act of worship, it's been a real time of thinking about you, about the people who I would normally share this act of worship with in the flesh there in our church building. And there's a gap within me as a whole. Uh, we miss you, we miss being together. There's a yearning. I believe that's a yearning of God. He wants, he ultimately will draw his people together in the new heaven and the new earth. And our, our gatherings together on a Sunday morning, particularly when we meet round the table with a foretaste of that, of the heavenly banquet. So maybe like, like me, you've got a, a little hole in you this morning or whenever you're taking part, thinking about all that has changed. May God, by his grace, minister to us all. Amen. Perhaps if you are feeling like I'm feeling, this final hymn will be a blessing to you. It's another one from uh, Emu Music and it's entitled Fairest Lord Jesus. It speaks very softly and tenderly, tenderly about the wonder of our Lord Jesus, our Saviour. Just picked out the line, none can be nearer, fairer or dearer, than you, my Saviour, to me bound. May this song be a blessing to you now. Thank you. 
Hello, I'm Chris Betteridge and I'm the Church Secretary and one of the Trustees. Trustees serve for periods of three years and so most years there will be trustees who are retiring at the end of their term and others elected to take up the post. This happens at our AGM and our constitution requires clear publicity of the upcoming elections. So bear with me while I make this official announcement. I'm going to be reading from this sheet. At our church members annual general meeting on Tuesday the 20th of April on Zoom, we will consider vacancies for four trustee positions of Stanley Road Baptist Church, Morecambe. Nominations are now invited for these roles of up to four trustees. All appointments are for a term of three years to ensure the smooth and efficient running of the church. Retiring trustees are eligible for re-election and may be nominated for a further three-year term. In accordance with our constitution, only members of Stanley Road Baptist Church may nominate candidates 
and only members may be nominated. Candidates must be 18 years or over and not disqualified under certain financial or criminal criteria. The full criteria are listed in the Church Constitution, a copy of which can be obtained from myself or Stephen Hewitt. Nominations must be in writing and include the consent of the candidate and the supporting signatures of two church members. No one may nominate more, the, more candidates than the four places vacant. Forms are available from me, Chris Betteridge, and should be returned to me no later than Sunday the 4th of April. A being a trustee is an important position and members are asked to therefore prayerfully consider people for the post who have a clear desire to serve God in the ministry and mission of this church. Any questions concerning qualifications, nomination or appointment of trustees should be addressed to our pastor, Stephen Hewitt. Now then, if you're watching this on Sunday morning, there's an opportunity to enjoy a coffee together at 11.45 on Zoom. This is a rare chance for us to actually see each other and catch up with any news that anybody wants to share. And I encourage you to pop along just for half an hour. Say hello. And then this evening, we have our Sunday social. Again, this is on Zoom and it'll take the form of a quiz. It's very light-hearted. And while some of us are rubbish, there is some keen competition at the top. The Zoom room opens at 7.15 and the first question's at 7.30. Bring your own snacks, it's easy, and join us for some fun. Get in touch with Stephen if you need the link. And now, after all that, let's quieten ourselves as we say together our closing prayer. Father God, as we go from here, we pray we will grow in our understanding of your love for us in Christ. And may we know the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives as we show your love to others for your glory forever and ever. Amen. <laughs>